Come on, hasn't this been amazing? I don't know that I want to quit. <laughs> we can have Pastor Stephen come back next week and we can just keep on worshiping. Is that all right? <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Listen, honestly, all of this preparation has just been welcoming the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to come set upon the throne that he's worthy to set upon. The throne of the praise and worship that he deserves. And when we worship with that kind of intensity, we build a beautiful place in the heavenlies where heaven comes close to earth and there's this spiritual throne that is created by the sound waves of your worship that says, God, you are welcome in this place. You are our King and our Lord. So I don't know what anyone else, what everyone else is doing outside of this place, but I know in this place we have declared that you are our God and that we worship you. And, and with that kind of invitation, he comes and sets upon his throne. But when a king sets upon his throne, that means you have our attention and you have, we have our complete allegiances unto you. It would be a tragedy to welcome in the king to sit upon his throne and then to remain in silence. God has something he wants to speak into your heart tonight. And our worship was just the welcome train, just the platform to say, come into this place to say what you want to say. So I want you to turn to your neighbor. I want you to, I don't know what you need to do. Just like give them that like, whoa, what is, what is going on in this place? Tell them, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I can't believe I'm here. This is going to be amazing. Now make your way to your seat because God's about to speak into the room and not a person here is going to want to miss it. Somehow years ago, God had it in his heart to establish a place then called Eastern Heights Church, now called the Heights Church, that would usher in his presence, not in just to this city, but into this region and ultimately into the ends of the earth. And I stand as a second, third, fourth generation leader in this place, the fourth pastor of the church, having inherited a move of God and having been told when I became the steward of what belonged to the Lord to lead out the next season of its ministry, to be careful not to let it roll backwards but to always keep it moving forward because if it doesn't stay moving forward, it will naturally start moving backwards. And I can honestly say thank you, Lord, that ministry is moving forward, amen? And that's because you have a desire to go closer to God and move ministry forward because the church is not the building, the church is you and I. And somehow, in addition to what he's been doing in this place, we have been connected with some of the greatest ministries and leadership that I know. And I'm shocked at like how God makes these connections. But a little over a year ago, my wife and I were invited to a pilot program that Gateway was doing on how to best minister to, mar uh, to, to leadership, especially senior pastors in the area of marriage because we spend so much time helping everyone else's marriage that sometimes their problems can become our problems and we can find ourselves needing help, but who helps the pastor when you're the pastor? And so Gateway says, well, if we brought all the pastors in the room, maybe they could help each other. So I didn't know what I was being invited to, but I was a test dummy for marriages and pastors. <laughs> you know, kind of like the crash dummy. They're like, we just need somebody we can wreck the car with and see what happens. Like, what happens at 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, and 60 miles an hour? And we sit in a room full of people like, how'd you get here? I don't know, how'd you get here? Like, did they think my marriage was bad? Is it going bad? I mean, like, why did we get picked to be in this place? 
So we laughed a lot. We ended up crying a lot. We uh, got crazy real with a group of people we did not know, and God did some amazing things. And one of those amazing things was connecting us with couples like Pastor Stephen and Tandra Warnock from New Covenant Church in Longview, Texas. And it's been a beautiful relationship for a little over a year now, and it's just getting started. And it's gonna continue to grow. And so they're, they're, they're great friends of ours. I'm a huge fan. He's pastoring a, a growing, fast-growing multi-campus church in Longview. His story and my story are so alike that we feel like we would just flip the page and like, hey, we're, his father pastored for many years. He's taken uh, the pulpit and the reins and he's doing a wonderful job. Would you stand to your feet? Did I say something wrong? Did you stand to your feet and give a big warm welcome to Pastor Stephen Warnock? All right, thank you guys. Man, Heights Church, what an amazing time. I don't know if they thought that that song they wrote was a risk, but I didn't think it was a risk. Uh, I need that on an album very quickly. Um, yeah. I don't know where, where Josh is, but that brother can sing. He cannot just sing, he can sing. I don't know if you caught what he was singing, but it was amazing. Uh, powerful, powerful song. Um, I wanna just echo what Pastor Cody said. We met a little over a year ago, and I just wanna first honor Pastor Cody and Marcy. We love you guys so much, and you, you need to know how great of pastors you have. So can we just honor them together for just a minute? <laughs> Honestly. Um, as he said, we, he was a little bit, he was honest. We met at a marriage intensive because we had intense problems in our marriages. And, no, I'm just kidding. Some are more intense than others. No, I'm kidding. It was good, though. It was amazing. And um, what I'll remember most about that was sitting around a fire uh, pit with Pastor Cody and Marcy and just sharing kind of our stories and our history and how similar they were. But we were in a season where we had one of our campuses where our lease got up and they didn't want to renew our lease and we had to kind of move back into one and it was a, a time of like, God, what's gonna happen? And there was an opportunity for us to purchase another church and I was presenting all of this to Cody with all of the problems I thought were there. And your pastor is a pastor of faith because he spoke a lot of faith into me that night. And he began to tell me what God was gonna do was greater than I could ever imagine. And my faith began to grow. And I'm just gonna tell you, you need people in your life who are gonna speak faith into you when you're questioning things around you. And that's what you have been for me. He'll randomly text me things that I'm just like, I don't think you have the right number of what you see in me, but man, thank you for that. It just, it builds my faith. And, uh, and I was just so honored uh, to get to know him and continue our relationship. And I also wanna say, uh, I got to know Preston as well, Pastor Preston, and I just wanna say, Preston, you know, my story similar to you guys is I, I actually, my background's in production, and then I became an executive pastor, and then I became a pastor, and so I know this path, and I just felt like the Lord told me to tell you that there is a new anointing coming on your life, and it's not just for systems and processes, which you're amazing at, uh, it's for something far greater that you're, you have a voice that God wants to speak through. So there's a fresh anointing coming to you for that. Um, and actually, you know, I, I was here last year at Propel, and I sat right over here, me and my wife, and uh, we, we were singing the song that you guys wrote last year, Generations, and I began to sing that song even on the way here. That song has stuck with me. The generations will sing your praise, and never in a million years would I have thought that one year later I would be standing up here speaking to you, because I was always afraid of speaking. That's why I didn't want to be a pastor. My dad was a pastor, I saw what they went through, and I was like, no thanks, you know, I'll do something else. Uh, but God had a different plan, and as I was praying, even today, I felt like the Lord had told me to share this with you, is that there are some pastors in this room that you thought never in a million years would I get up and speak on a platform? But God is saying that if he put it in your heart, he will provide everything you need. You already have it inside of you. Just let the process happen. If that's you in this room tonight, I believe that's a prophetic word for you as well. But one thing I love about your church, it's a generational church. And my church is a generational church. I'm a second generation pastor. And uh, I, I love 
seeing the next generation be empowered for what God has for them because what you're building here is not just for you, it's for a generation not yet to be born. And your pastor knows that and that's the sacrifice that he's making for the future. And so I, I love generations. In fact, I, I wanna share a picture of my family. I have um, three beautiful girls. I don't know, if they'll probably put up here in a second. And my beautiful wife is with me. Yeah, these are my three girls. Uh, so y'all pray for me because uh, one is 15, 13, and 10, and one gets her permit this week. So please, please be praying for me. But here, here just a quick funny story about my oldest, uh, Rachel, in the top corner there. Um, we know uh, Elaine real well, Pastor Elaine, who spoke last night, known her for a very long time. And my daughter, when I told her I was speaking at this conference and Elaine was speaking there, she said, Dad, you, are you gonna have to speak after Elaine? <laughs> I said, yeah? And she was like, ugh. It's <laughs> like, thanks for the vote of confidence. I mean, I appreciate you. But you know, anyway, and Elaine was amazing last night as she always is, but I wanna jump into uh, the message for tonight. And honestly, I was uh, praying and preparing this word for uh, this conference and I felt like I was supposed to share it at our church as well because uh, something that has been burdening me is, I, is that I believe that God, not just this year, but I think globally he is looking for a people who really are all in with him, who aren't halfway in, who aren't saying, maybe I'll do some things for God, but are saying, I am all in for God. And, and that is a burden of mine, and it's, it's really the word of the year for us in our church, but I believe it's that God is looking throughout the earth for people who will give him their yes. And so I was thinking, what does it mean to be all in? Because that's sometimes what the question is. What is it that God wants from me? And when you think about that throughout scripture, Jesus specifically, he answered this question a number of times, and it's actually all the way back to Deuteronomy. But in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 12, there were a group of religious leaders who were always questioning Jesus and asking him, that, you know, what is it that we need to be doing? Like, what's the greatest commandment? We wanna keep all these laws, and we wanna do all the right things, but what's the greatest commandment? And in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus responds, and he says, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he says the most important commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The greatest, if you wanna know what God truly wants from you, is to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. That is a picture of everything in you. That is all in. That's saying, God, I'm gonna love you with every fiber of my being. And, that, and you look in the scripture and you can see some examples of this, but there's one particular example that I wanna look at tonight. I wanna dive into this passage, what might be a familiar passage to you, but it's found just two chapters later in Mark chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, turn here to Mark chapter 14. I'm going to read this passage, and then we're going to pull some things out of it. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. If you're there, say, I'm there. If you're not there, say, hold up. I got a couple. That means you have real Bibles. Okay. <laughs> you can always tell the ones with real Bibles, like, hold on, I'm still flipping. So I'll jump into it for you. All right, Mark chapter 14, verse three. While he was in Bethany, this is speaking of Jesus, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. And some of those who were present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could, and she poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. I love this story. 
It's, it's a powerful story. You've probably heard this story before. In fact, it's recorded in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. There is a version in Luke where a woman takes a, a, an alabaster jar and pours oil on his feet, but based on context, it does not seem to be the same person. Based on timing and location and the other people there, this is not the same woman. But this woman is, is the one that's in Matthew, Mark, and John. And so you have to read all of them, actually, to get the full context of who was at this dinner party. And I don't know about you, but since my background is in media and production, I like to see the Bible as a movie. When I read the scriptures, I try to put myself there. I want to see the scene. I want to picture what was happening. So if we could do that in this story, imagine that you're at this dinner party. It's at the home of a man named Simon the leper. How would you like to be known forever as Simon the leper? What an incredible nickname to be called. That's like making, like, you know, Zacchaeus. It's like he, we call him a wee little man. Um, nowhere does it say that in scripture. And I really always feel bad for Zacchaeus. We owe him an apology when we get to heaven because we don't know how tall he was. And being a short man myself, I don't, I don't appreciate that, right? And boy, Tony got me. Anthony's right here too. We get it. We got it, you know? Doesn't feel good to be called a wee little man. But Simon the leper, how would you like your nickname to be about your affliction? Or your nickname to be about your past issues? Like, well, here comes Stephen the liar. Don't love that. You know, there's Amy the adulterer. I'm, seriously, I mean, that's, no one's going to a dinner party over there. <laughs> Did I say too much? No, okay, keep going. But Simon the leper, now, we know that he didn't have leprosy currently because they wouldn't have been eating at his house. He'd have been ceremonially unclean. They could not have entered there and eaten with him. And, and many people believe, and I, and I believe this as well, that Jesus had healed Simon, which is why Jesus was there, because he had got his healing, and now he invited Jesus, which is, by the way, what we're all supposed to do, that when you receive your healing from Jesus, you gotta bring other people into your environment to experience the same thing that you've experienced. I mean, Matthew the tax collector, when Jesus said, follow me, Matthew dropped everything and began to follow Jesus, and it's shortly after that, it says that he threw a dinner party at his house and invited all the tax collectors and sinners, and he brought Jesus as well. And maybe this year, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to start bringing the people around you into this church, into your home, into environments where they can encounter the same Jesus that you've encountered. It's what we're supposed to do. So, so we're at this dinner party, and Simon, who previously had leprosy, was there. But if you read John chapter 12, this account in John tells us that Lazarus was also there. You remember Lazarus, the man that Jesus raised from the dead. Can you imagine the stories going around the table? People asking, Simon, what was it like to have leprosy? Like, you know, were your sores open? Did your arms fall off? I mean, yeah. and tell us about how Jesus healed you. Like, I mean, and then all of a sudden, you know, at a dinner party, there's always somebody that has to one-up the story. I see some nudges. Lazarus probably piped up. It's like, that sounds pretty bad and stuff, Simon, but your boy was dead. <laughs> Leprosy's rough, but I was gone. I was four days gone. I stank, and I came out the grave. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an amazing dinner party to be at, right? And if you read, you also know that Martha was there. Martha was the sister of Lazarus, but Martha was not participating. Martha was serving. This is something Martha was good at. Martha was the one you want serving you at a dinner party. She's the waitress you want at the restaurant because your cup will never run empty. Your food will always be hot. She's the hostess with the mostest. She is a servant. But then there's this other woman. This other woman who we can pick up from the context of John and the other books that talk about this, that it's, it's Mary, Martha's sister, that Mary seemingly had no place in this dinner party. She just enters the scene unannounced, unasked, undeterred by everything else going on, and she walks right up to Jesus. Probably this was culturally breaking some protocol for a woman to be entering like this and coming right up to the dinner table with Jesus. And she does this incredible act of worship. And it was this act of worship that caused all the controversy. 
And I just want to say, by the way, it is always your worship that's the issue. The issue will always be your worship. It's not a question of if you're going to worship. It's a question of what or who or how you're going to worship. Because we as human beings were created to worship. And whether you acknowledge it or not, you're already worshiping something. It's the question of who or what that causes this controversy. The battle is always over your worship. That's why Satan fell from heaven. He wanted to be worshiped. But I think we don't fully understand worship because we've boiled worship down to a song set on Sunday morning. We've reduced worship to a genre of music. And yes, you can worship by song and by your words, but, but if that's all we think it is, we're in danger of becoming the people that Jesus said when he referenced Isaiah 29, that they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their hearts are not really with me. Yeah, their words are, but their hearts are not with me. Worship is more than a song you sing. Worship is what you do with your life. Worship is what you give your heart to. Worship is what you give your affection to. It's what you give your affection to. And I'm just telling you, it's your affection and your attention that everything is vying for. Everything in this world is battling for your affection and your attention because whatever has your affection will have you. This is what Jesus is after. He wants your affection. And I wanna look at this story and I wanna look at three things that we see Mary do that really I believe that if you're gonna go all in with Jesus, if you're, if you're gonna say I'm all in with you, this is three things that he wants from us. And if you're taking notes, here is the first one tonight and that is he wants unrelenting love. He wants your unrelenting love. Love, picture again Mary. Mary comes right in, pours out her affection, pours out her love on Jesus. He was the object of her affection. See it with me, again, mentally. Walks right in, undeterred by anybody else in the room. Speaks to nobody else. She has one object that she's after, and that's Jesus. I see things in movies, like I said. So when I read this, I pictured, and you've probably seen this in a movie, I pictured a big like room, a big ballroom, or a, they, you see them in movies all the time where there's like this, a ton of people in the room, and there's music playing and stuff, and somebody opens the door, and they see somebody across the way, and it's like everything slows down. The, the crowd noise drowns out, and all they're doing is they're making eye contact, and they make their way across the room. Now, I picture my wife like this. And if you know my wife, my wife loves people. I mean, she loves people. Uh, if you're into strengths finders and stuff like that, her strength is woo, which stands for winning others over which means that if she goes into a crowded room, she wants to talk to everybody in that room, she wants to find out their story, she wants to become friends with them, she wants to know about their kids, and, she, and so she, that's her challenge. When we go into a room, she's like, I wanna talk to everybody. It's gotten so bad sometimes that we'll be on a date, and I'm sitting across the table from her, and I'm trying to talk to her, but like, she's like looking past me. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, shh, they just met online, uh, eHarmony. <laughs> And this is their first date. And I'm like, I'm right here. Like, I, you're here with me. So if she were to come into a room that's completely crowded and lots of people, lots of things vying for her attention, and she sees me, and we make eye contact, and she just comes at me like this. I'm telling you, I'm like, woo, she loves me. I'm the object of her affection. Nothing is distracting her from me. This is what was happening with Mary. She came straight in, went straight across. Nothing was gonna stop her. She had come with the sole purpose of worshiping him. She had come with the sole purpose of pouring out her love on him. And she wasn't worried about the protocol of the day. She wasn't worried about formalities. He had her affection. And a good question as we start 2024 is, has your relationship with God become simply about protocol? Are you checking off the boxes? Do you show up, but you're not really there? 
Do you go to your time with the Lord, but you're scrolling on Instagram the whole time? Are you taking photos of the verses to post, but those verses aren't really getting into you? You're not really focused on him. He's not really the object of your affection. It's a good question to ask, but we know that he was Mary's object of affection because Mary had modeled a lifestyle of just sitting at the feet of Jesus. In fact, at another dinner party, it got her into trouble with her sister Martha who was up serving, she was doing her thing, she was working hard, and Mary's just sitting at the feet of Jesus, just swooning over him, just listening to his words, hanging on everything that he's saying. And Martha gets upset, you've heard the story, you've probably read it, Martha gets upset and is like, Jesus, would you make her do something? She's so lazy. <laughs> like, I'm doing something that matters, I'm serving people. Get, get her up, Jesus. And Jesus is like, Martha, you got it twisted. What Mary's doing is what matters, because Mary loves me. Mary's sitting at my feet. What does God want from you? He doesn't just want your perfect attendance. He wants your affection. He wants your heart. He wants your love. That's why Jesus said the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with everything in you. And you may say, well, I, how do I know if I'm doing that? How do I know if I'm loving Jesus? Well, in John 15, if you've never read John 15, spend some time in John 15 this January because it's all about, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and if, and if you will abide in my love, if you'll stay connected to me, if, if we'll have this symbiotic relationship where you're dwelling with me, living with me, receiving my love, then he says, you'll do what I say. In fact, like six or seven times in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands. If you love me, you'll do what I say. In other words, what he's saying is the way you prove you love me is you do what I say. It's by what you do. In fact, this is the way that I, I, I've always seen it is your love for him comes from your relationship with him, but it results in obedience to him. When you love God, it comes from the relationship you've built with him, but it will produce obedience. And obedience is more than just a set of rules, by the way. And that's what the Pharisees were asking. So we can make sure we're doing all the checklist things. What are the things we're supposed to do? True obedience is not just a set of rules you're checking off. True obedience is when you say, God, I love you so much. Whatever you want is what I want. Whatever you ask of me is what I'm gonna do. Because of my great love for you, I'll do whatever, I'm all in. That's what it's all about. And Mary's love for Jesus just drove her to do everything she knew to do, which was to give him her all. And what I love most is she didn't come to Jesus asking for anything. She just came to give something. You know, you wanna know what love looks like? It looks a lot like giving. It looks a lot like coming to give not to get. That's why the scripture says God so loved the world that he gave. Love will produce a giving. What would this year look like if you didn't come to God every day asking for something, but you just came to give him something, to give him your love, to give him your affection? That's what Mary was doing in this moment. She walks right up to him, undeterred by everybody else. It's her unrelenting love that caused her to go straight up to him and do something so crazy, so uncommon, so costly. She began to pour out this oil on him. And, and I believe this is the second thing that, that we see that Mary did that you and I will need to do. It's gonna take an uncommon sacrifice, a costly sacrifice sacrifice. It's uncommon. It's not normal to everybody else. It's going to cost. But unfortunately, we live in a culture today that if it's quick, if it's cheap, if it doesn't cost me very much, it doesn't take too much of my time, I'm down. Yep, yep, I'm in. Yep. Always looking for a deal. That's why Black Friday is such a big deal. People will fight over a discounted TV. But that's bled into Christianity, Western Christianity specifically, here in the United States. It's bled into Western Christianity to where people say, as long as you don't want too much of my time, I'll give you an hour a week. As long as you don't want too much of my energy or, or too much of my resources, I'm down. I'm down with Jesus as long as it doesn't cost me 
too much. I, I want discount Jesus. I want great value Jesus. I want my life with Jesus on the side. That's how we treat him. And we only come to him when we want something from him. But I just want to as lovingly and boldly tell you tonight that cheap Christianity is a counterfeit Christianity. Any gospel, any gospel that tells you that there is no cost, no sacrifice to following Jesus is a false gospel. The disciples paid dearly with their lives and Jesus asked himself, for your life. And you say, oh, well, well, salvation's free. Of course it's free. It's free in the sense that you can't earn it. You would never be good enough to receive what Jesus had for you. You weren't all cute and cuddly, so he was like, you know what, I like them so much. No, it's free in the sense that he paid for it before you could do anything, but he does ask for your life. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, he said, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, for me, you will find it. If you try to hold tightly and say, I want this life, but come on, Jesus, you can, you can come along, you're going to lose your life. But if you willingly sacrifice it, that's what worship is. It's a willing sacrifice of your life to God. That's why they say we bring a sacrifice of praise to God. I'm reminded in 2 Samuel chapter 24 when David, King David, he wanted to build an altar for a sacrifice to worship God. And he didn't have any land to do it on, so he found a Jebusite man and he was like, hey, uh, let me buy this land from you so I can build an altar to worship God. And the Jebusite man's like, you can have it, you're the king. And he's like, no, I refuse. I will buy it because I refuse to offer something to God that costs me nothing. It will always cost you something. Is it even worship or love if it doesn't cost you something? I mean, if you have kids, you know that love costs you something. It, it costs you your time. It costs you your sleep. It sure costs you your money. Ladies, it costs you your body. It will cost you something. If you're married, <laughs> you know it costs you something. Marriage is the greatest picture of all in because it costs you everything. If you, if you want to be married right, you got to die. If you want to follow Jesus with your life, you got to die. That's what it says. When you go all in, it will cost you something. That's why Jesus tried to tell over and over again, it's gonna cost you something. Luke 14, multiple times, he says, what kind of king would go out to war without first counting the cost? What kind of builder would start building without counting the cost? He's saying, be prepared. If you're gonna follow me, it's gonna cost you something. And Mary knew that. And here's the good news, though. When you see his worth, when you see what he's done for you, when you have a revelation of his love, it does not matter the cost. Mary had counted the cost. She knew the cost. And according to this, the cost was a year's wages, an entire year's salary, 300 denarii. It represented her livelihood. It represented her backup plan if things don't go as anticipated. And that did not matter to her. So in essence, when she came and she poured that on Jesus, what she was saying is, I, I'm not holding anything back. I'm pouring out everything I have. I'm not saving some for the future because I know he's, he is the future. He holds the future. And if I don't have him, I don't have a future anyway. That's, that's the cost that Mary was pouring out on Jesus, and it's what the scriptures tell us is gonna cost us. In fact, Romans chapter 12, verse one, Paul encourages uh, the church, and he urges us, I believe, today. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's love, in view of who he is, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper what? You can talk. Worship. It's your true and proper worship. It's a sacrifice. And I'm just telling you that if you're going to live for Jesus, if you're going to go all in for Jesus, it will cost you something. It will cost you living holy in a world that is unholy. 
It will cost you leaning in when everybody else is leaning out. It will cost you being willing to be set apart when everybody else looks the same. It will cost you holding up the word of God as the standard of righteousness when everything in culture is trying to tear it apart. It's going to cost you. But you cannot care what other people think. It's a willing sacrifice. And those who are willing to do it have laid down their lives for Jesus. And that leads to the third one. And what we see in Mary and what I believe God is looking for in us is this unashamed devotion. Where we really don't care what everybody else thinks. Because after, come, after Mary comes and does this extravagant act of worship and she pours it out, she had counted the cost. If you read in John's version, it says that she got down on her knees and she began to wipe his feet with her hair. Because the oil had run all over him, all the way down to his feet. And Mary, in an act of humility, in an act of surrender, she gets down on her knees. You can't get on your knees in pride. And she begins to just wipe his feet because she loved him. She's purely devoted to him. She didn't care what anybody else in the room thought. But that's when they started to make fun of her. That's when they started to criticize her. They began to get indignant. What'd they say? Why waste this perfume? This is such a costly thing. And if you're gonna go all in for Jesus, people will not understand your devotion to him. They're not gonna understand, why do you go to church every week? That seems like a waste of time. (laughs) Why are you at this Propel conference every single day? It seems like a waste of time. Why do you tithe? It seems like a waste of money. Why are you on the dream team? It seems like a waste of your energy. Why do you do 21 days of prayer and fasting? That seems a bit extreme. They won't understand your devotion and they'll begin to criticize you. People will criticize your devotion to God so they feel better about themselves. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed people begin to criticize in others what they can't see in themselves achieving or attaining or they haven't done yet? So if I bring you down, I can feel like I'm up. If I make you look bad, I don't look as bad. If I make you look crazy for going all in, I don't look as bad for not being all in. You see it when people are like doing dieting and working out and people are trying to get right and other people are like, that seems a bit extreme. It's because they themselves don't want to do it. Like, you really should eat something. I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat something. <laughs> All right, that's what they're doing. They're real, in, in reality, the issue is, is people will criticize your sacrifice to justify their selfishness. And you might be going, well, how do you know it's selfish? Because if you read John's version, it tells us who it is that's criticizing. It's not just some random person, it's Judas. Judas is the one who's criticizing, Judas who would sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, Judas who the Bible tells us is actually robbing the offering basket. He's taking money from the, from the offering basket that people are giving to Jesus. So what Judas was seeing is an extreme act of sacrifice and he's going, that's money out of my pocket. I could have been stealing that. I mean, it's probably what he was, he wasn't thinking it was stealing, but that's what he was doing. It was a selfishness. And so he tries to make up a reason that could have been given to the poor. And Jesus' response is not a criticism of giving to the poor, by the way. He said, the poor you'll always have with you. It doesn't mean the poor don't matter. We live in a broken world. Of course, there will always be poor people is what he's saying. He's clarifying the value system that matters. And the value system that matters is your devotion to God above everybody and everything else. That's what he's trying to say. And I just want to prepare you That if you're gonna go all in for Jesus, it's going to look extreme to the world. People are going to criticize you. They're gonna say it's a waste of your money. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of your energy. But I wanna encourage you tonight that your worship is never a waste. Your devotion is never a waste. Your sacrifice is never a waste. It's producing something in you and through you that you won't see in the moment. It's never a waste. And Jesus didn't think it was a waste either because he said what she's doing, it's beautiful. And then he said, leave her alone. I don't know about you, but I like that part. (laughs) 
I like when Jesus gets on to other people, not me. <laughs> but it reminds us that if you go all in for Jesus, God will be your defender. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to try to explain to everybody why you're doing so much. You're not doing it for them anyway. It really doesn't matter what they think. It's an unashamed devotion. She brought what she had, the Bible says. She brought this container. And it really wasn't even about the container, was it? The controversy was what was in the container. That's too expensive. There's something valuable on the inside of that container, right? And again, isn't this just like a picture of what scripture is always telling us, that man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart, that it's not really about how you look on the outside, it's about what's going on on the inside, and there's something inside of you that is valuable, there's something inside of you that matters. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter four, Paul tells it this way, I love this verse, he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power that belongs to God. He's saying this treasure, what's the treasure? If you read a few verses earlier, it's the treasure of the knowledge and the glory of God of who he is living inside of us. We're just a jar of clay, but we have something valuable on the inside. There is a treasure on the inside. We're just vessels carrying something valuable on the inside. Mary was just a vessel carrying something valuable on the inside. In fact, that, that chapter, chapter seven, uh, I mean, chapter four of 2 Corinthians goes on to say that we carry around with us the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus can be seen through us. It's not what's on the outside, it's on the inside. Mary was a vessel bringing something valuable. And then it says that she broke it and she poured it out on Jesus. Have you ever thought, why did she do such an extreme thing? Again, we have to go back to the context. Mary, who was the sister of Martha, was also the sister of Lazarus. So that means Mary was there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That Mary was there when Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. What would you pay for a resurrection? Would it be a year's salary? Two years, a million dollars? I mean, what's a resurrection worth to you? Is it worth everything? Because here's the beautiful thing about this story. This isn't just Mary's story. This is my story. And this is your story. Because we were dead and now we're alive. We were lost and now we're found. So what is it worth? It's worth everything. It's worth everything. That is, that is why we pour it all out for him. Paul, again, who said that we're, these, we're just these jars of clay, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he keeps talking about this over and over again. Paul went through more than you and I could ever imagine, and he says that everything that I've attained, everything that I've done, everything that I've accomplished in this life, I count as rubbish, I count as garbage compared to knowing Jesus, the worth of who he is. It's worth more than everything else in this world world. It's worth more than money. It's worth more than accolades. It's worth more than any company you could give me. It's worth more. And at the end of his life, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's writing to Timothy, a young pastor, and he is challenging Timothy, and he's encouraging Timothy, and he's saying, stay the course, Timothy. Don't give up. Don't give in. Preach the gospel, Timothy. And he's encouraging him. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he says this. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. That's a sacrifice to God. And my time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, he says, but to all who have longed for his appearing, to everybody who pours it out. What Paul was saying, he said, Timothy, I've been pouring it out from day one. 
I've poured out my love on God. I've poured out my life as a sacrifice. I don't want to get to heaven full, Timothy. I want to be empty. I don't want to get to heaven and say, God, I held something back for you. He's saying, pour it out. And he's encouraging Timothy to do the same because he's worth it. But what I love about Mary's story is that Mary didn't come and just go, you know what? Here, Jesus, here's a little bit of my perfume. No, Mary said, you know what? He's worth it all. He's worth it all. And she took her, she took it and she broke it open before the Lord. I, I want to show you this picture because until you're broken, what's in you can't come out. The treasure that God has put in you only comes out through your brokenness. That's why we say worship broken before the Lord. Love broken, serve broken, give broken. Pour out your life before the Lord. Listen, you might be going, oh, yeah, but this is what my life looks like. It's, I, I, my life's already broken. Good. It's what he wants. He wants your brokenness. He doesn't want the put together pieces. He's saying, I want you to live broken before me. What can, what can he do with somebody who is broken? See, Mary is known, we're talking about Mary because of her devotion, because of her sacrifice, because of her love for God that she was willing to pour it out, which tells us that the right person at the right time with the right heart who's willing to be broken before the Lord can make history. Because Jesus said that wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the gospel is preached from now on, we'll talk about this woman. And here we are 2,000 years later still honoring what she did as a broken vessel before the Lord. What can God do with a broken vessel? He can change the world with a broken vessel. A broken vessel can make history, but I want you to think about this. Because what did Jesus say? He said, why she's doing this is she's anointing my body from my burial. Because six days later, Jesus would go to the cross and he would be beaten, and he would be bruised, and he, and he would be spit on, and he would be cursed, which means that while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he went to the cross smelling like Mary's worship. He had already been anointed. Where there was a stench of death, there was a fragrance coming from Jesus, which is what 2 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, it's not 2 Corinthians, Ephesians 5, 2 says. It says that Christ offered himself as a fragrant sacrifice to God, as a fragrant offering to God. It was sweet smelling to God, which tells us that his sacrifice with your sacrifice is a beautiful aroma that not even death can overwhelm. It's the aroma of God. It's the aroma that permeates suffering. It's the aroma from the oil, from the crushing that says something beautiful has come out of my life. It's the aroma that smells like victory when everything else looks like death. It's the aroma of God in you that's coming out of your brokenness. Your life, if your life is filled with God and you're saying, I'm going all in with him. Your life is filled with him and when you live broken, it's this aroma that permeates every environment you go into. It'll permeate your home. It'll permeate your workplace. It'll permeate your school. It'll permeate your marriage. It'll permeate your kids. Everywhere you go, the smell of victory, the smell of Jesus. The Bible says your life is a fragrance. It's a fragrance. What's the aroma? Do people smell Christ or do they smell you? When you go all in for Jesus, when you say, I'm willing to go all in, God can use an incredible broken vessel like that to change the world. And I know that the theme of the conference is a new sound. And I would just say that if you want a new sound to be in your life this year, let it be the sound of your brokenness. Let it be the sound of your yes to God. Let it be the sound of letting go of the things you've been holding on to. There's always a part where saying, God, I don't know if I'm willing to give this to you. If you want to hear a new sound, drop it to the ground and say, God, I'm, I'm letting go of everything. I, I'm not just going to show up on Sunday. I'm going to be here every day pouring it out, pouring it out, pouring it out. That's the new sound God wants to do in your life. 
where it's not just while you're here at the Heights and we're worshiping God, and that's amazing. There is an, an incredible sound coming out of the Heights Church, and you get to be a part of it, but God wants a sound to come out of you. And it's the sound of your surrender. What can God do with a broken vessel? He can change the world. Would you bow your heads with me? I just want to take a minute and pray, and then we're going to sing some more to the Lord and pour out our love on him. But this has to be something you do. This has to be something you want. This is not something I can do for you. But I believe God is looking for a people. I believe God is looking for a church who would say, God, we're surrendering everything. We're going all in. We're not holding back anything anymore. I'm not gonna be on the fringes. I'm tired of riding the fences. I'm tired of saying I'm showing up on Sunday and everybody thinks it's good because I sing loud, but I go home and I'm holding on to things in the private places of my life. And God is saying, let it go. Break yourself open tonight. But it has to be your choice. If that's you, I want you to just declare with your mouth, God, I'm going all in. I'm going all in. Break me, God, so that you can change the world around me through my brokenness. It's his sacrifice with your sacrifice that will change the world. And God, we just declare that tonight. We say, I'm all in. I'm all in. And I pray, God, as we surrender, as we let go, as we live broken, God, I pray that you would heal the parts of our hearts that we've hidden from others, that we've hidden from you, that it's only in the surrender can we be healed. And I pray that that happens tonight. Do the work, Holy Spirit, that only you can do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, would you stand with us? And what I want us to do is we're going to go back into a time of worship. And if you truly mean that with your heart, begin to just pour out your love on him. Set your affection on him. Let him be the object of your affection tonight. Don't worry about anything else. Don't check your watch. Don't check your phone. Don't check your neighbor. But begin to pour out your worship on God. Come on, let's worship.